Hey guys, Buildzoid here, and today we're going to be doing a very casual stat patty video because, uh, yeah, AMD A5, the A520 chipset has, uh, uh, well, been sort of announced, I guess. Not really, it, it hasn't really launched because you can't buy it yet, but there are motherboard models uh, listed on various motherboard vendor sites. And, you know, the interesting thing about A520 is it actually supports memory overclocking. And I have a sneaking suspicion that you might end up being able to adjust something like, say, power limits or something in the BIOS, which would basically give you PB... Like, you might have PBO functionality on these boards. Um, like, I I'm not saying you will, okay? I, I suspect that it might somehow sneak its way into the BIOSes. Um, or it might just be kind of left in there and AMD forgot to remove it. That's also totally possible because... Well, it's AMD BIOS. It's similar to AMD drivers. <laughs> um, so, you know, if AMD forgot to remove a feature, that wouldn't necessarily surprise me. Though at the same time, sometimes AMD removes features for no good reason, like with the Fury X's memory overclocking support. And I've still not, forget, like, I've still not gotten over that. Anyway, um... Yeah, so today we're just going to take a quick look at the various Gigabyte A520 boards, and I've already gone through these, so... Basically, the two boards I find most interesting are the A520MH, because this is probably going to the, be the cheapest A520 board Gigabyte is releasing. And I say that because it has the least letters at, in its name, right? It's A520MH. And if we look at all the other boards, we have the S2H or DS3H. That's four letters. That's got to be so expensive. Then we've got another four, six letters. Right, even more freaking letters, that's going to be even more expensive. Then we have uh, uh, 10 letters. Actually, this is 11 letters, and this is 10 letters. Though, funnily enough, the 11-letter motherboard is not going to be more expensive than the... Oh, wait, no, I shouldn't count the M. Um, yeah, so this is 10 letters. That's also 10 letters. Because the, the, the M, it's not actually part of the chipset name, but Gigabyte treats it as part of the chipset name, right? Like, because otherwise this would be a two-letter board, which still puts it at the bottom. But no, I like it being a one-letter board. And then we have a board like this where you're paying for two letters, right? Um, anyway, so yeah, this should be the cheapest because it's a single-letter name. Um, but I find it very, very interesting. And the reason I find it very, very interesting is because it has two DIMM slots. So it's going to be absolutely killer at memory overclocking because it's got two DIMM slots. It does also only have a four-layer PCB. The VRM is... Uh, it's a four-phase. However, it does have two low-side MOSFETs per phase, so it shouldn't be too bad like the v core is a four phase uh, you've got two low side mosfets per phase it shouldn't be too bad three phase soc vrm the the main thing with this vrm though is like if you're running like a 3600 or something this honestly it doesn't matter um if you're running a 105 watt tdp cpu though those actually have a hundred and like say the 3900 or the 3950x those have 144 watt power limits i could like, I would not trust a VRM with no heatsink to handle 144 watts. It's not impossible. It's just kind of unlikely that something like this would do that. At least in my opinion. I've never actually tested it, but I'd, I'd be very, very surprised if this kind of VRM was okay with a 140 watt CPU power draw. Um, however, with something like, a you know, a 3600, which has an 88 watt power limit, yeah, this would be completely fine, especially if you're using the stock cooler and not overclocking because the stock cooler blows air directly down at the motherboard. So it's going to indirectly cool your VRM. And, you know, even a very small amount of airflow makes a huge difference to VRM thermals. So a downdraft air cooler, yeah, like I... 3600, 3700X, I would have no problem running either of those CPUs on a motherboard like this. And I would specifically go for this because this one has the two DIMM slot memory configuration, which is just a huge advantage for memory overclocking. Now, things I don't, I'm not really a fan of. The rear I.O., this, 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 there's no USB, like six USB ports is not enough USB ports. You do get Q flash, which is cool. So you get BIOS, BIOS flashback functionality on the back. Um... I'm also not a fan of the SATA port layout. Like, they stick straight up out of the board. And, uh, like, these first two are fine. Like, you can probably... Like, this one is... F like, this one's not a problem because you can just use a right-angle SATA port, like, SATA ca cable, and, like, that's that's going to go out this way. And, 
Like it's gonna look weird and ugly, but it, it'll fit under a GPU. This one, on the other hand, is like, I'm not sure if that one won't run into issues with the other port being populated, which is like, uh... And then these two, these are far away enough from the GPU that those aren't a concern. But yeah, I'm not really a fan of what they did did with that here. Also, notice how this motherboard is not quite AT, like MATX, right? Like, it just gets chopped off right here before the actual standoffs. Um, yeah, so th this thing... The, the, the SATA ports are kind of like, this might cause issues with GPUs, um, which which is kind of annoying. Oh man, this just gave me an idea for like the world's most imbalanced system build. Hear me out. Two 16 gig DIMMs, 3700X, 2070 Super on this motherboard. Or 2080 Super. Like honestly, whatever, whatever, uh, whatever GPU you want to combine with a 3700X on this board. Like, it sounds completely stupid, but I, I like you're not overclocking, right? The memory support's going to be fine. Um, this is like the funny thing about this VRM is this is a VRM design that Gigabyte used on both X370 and X470 motherboards, as well as some relatively expensive B450s. And I don't think they had any particular... And, uh, well, they did use it on a bunch of B350 motherboards as well. So this is like a VRM that they've actually used on motherboards with straight-up overclocking support. And it's just like, well, a 3700X is an 88-watt power limit CPU, right? Like, it's a 65-watt TDP. It has an 88-watt power limit. Like, it's, this VRM is going to be fine, especially because the, the 3700... Like, it has the downdraft air cooler, right? You've got the Wraith Prism with the 3700X two 16 gig memory dim like i i like all the, like it sounds really stupid but i like that like I, I i like i don't really see a huge issue with like that combination of parts actually like if you're running at stock that's completely fine um which uh yeah i i like i, I i've i've turned into a casual <laughs> Well, no, actually, I haven't, because I, I would overclock that memory to, like, 30... Like, my goal, if I was running that exact configuration, would be, like, I'd probably be going for, like, a relatively nice kit of, like, Samsung BDI um, for, for that 32 gigs of memory. Like, basically, I would take all the money I saved on my motherboard, and I would shove it into my memory kit. Because um, then you could go and run, like, 3800 CL14 memory on this. Um, the board should have no problem doing that because the board is about like gigabyte says it can do 5,000 and I have no doubt that it can do 5,000 on like, like it's a two dimmer. Like, of course it's going to do 5,000. It doesn't matter that it has a four layer PCB. So yeah, I think this board is really cool because it's just like, it's the cheapest a 520 gigabyte offers. It's a two dimmer. The VRM is, like, for, for no overclock, downdraft air cooler, low power Ryzen's totally fine. Um, SATA ports are a bit weird. Rear I.O. is kind of kind of awful. But you do get a 1x PCIe slot over here, so you can add USB ports using that. Or get, like, if you don't like, like, uh, if we go over here, you know, you've got Realtek Audio, of course. Low-end Realtek Audio, which it's just, at, for boards like this, that's the norm. Real tech land, so you could potentially get like the one X slot gives you some flexibility to change what kind of LAN networking or audio or USB ports you have, right? You can you can kind of change that. Um, also, there's internal USB headers, but there the thing is the be, this board being as cut down as it is, I don't think there's actually that many of them, is there? Like you get one front, two front USB 2.0s, you get a COM port and a TPM port. Yeah, you have front audio. And a single USB 3.0, which I know it's labeled 3.2 Gen 1 or whatever, like whatever the hell it is, but I, I call that 3.0. Get a clear CMOS, uh, yeah, you get clear CMOS pins, so you can wire that up to your reset button. Um, the, the biggest downside to this board, if you are going to be memory overclocking, is that I'm pretty sure this doesn't have any troubleshooting LEDs, which it just, like, it gets kind of annoying if you don't have those. But, um... Uh, yeah, like, honestly, very interesting motherboard, in my opinion, because I also think this is probably going to be around $60, like, plus minus 10, probably more like plus 10 more so than minus 10, but, like, this this got to be cheap, because there's no VRM heatsink, it's got two dim slots, it's the cut-down MATX as much as possible, right? Um, 
There's barely any rear I.O. Like, they're so cheap, they didn't even, they don't even have the metal inserts for the M.2 port. Though, there's, I, there's some kind of retention thing for the M.2 anyway, so it's not like you can't use the M.2 slot. Um, I'm not sure how that works. I don't really pay that much attention to M.2 devices, but yeah, like, I find this board very interesting. Now, they do have a slightly more expensive version in the S2H, and basically what the S2H does is it adds a VGA port, it adds the, adds some metal insert, like, it adds the metal inserts, and I think that's it. Oh, the COM port changed color. That's what, actually, no. Yeah, the COM port changed color. Here it's white, there it's black. Um, oh, and the, the front panel header... Wait, is that... Wait, why would you make the front panel header white? So some ports changed color, that and that that's about it. Um, the same memory support. The thing is, like, this board just... Like, it's the same board, they just added a VGA port. So I, I don't really... Like, I, I'm not seeing the benefits here. Um, and this one's going to cost more, because it's got two more letters in the name instead of just one. Um, anyway... I might be wrong, like, this This should still be around 70, like, I'm, I might be wrong about the price, but I still think that, like, that board's gonna be cheap, and it, it's so cool that it has memory overclocking support, like, that's the, like, I, I'm honestly kind of tempted that I might, you know what, I'll actually do that, I'll buy that board, um, because, like, again, it's probably gonna be really cheap, I'm gonna buy that board, I'm gonna do some memory overclocking on it, because... I want to see, like, I'm pretty sure you should be able to, like, that should still hit, like, you know, at least memory overclocks on par with, like, six layer X5, well, yeah, X570 motherboards, because the thing is, the chipset doesn't determine the memory overclocking capabilities, the BIOS and the PCB does. I'm assuming that, though, this being a really cheap gigabyte board, it's going to come with a memory voltage limit of 1.5 volts, which is fine for daily usage, but... It's gonna like for, say for going five gigahertz on memory. That's actually gonna be kind. Of, eh, that might get in the way. That actually might get in the way a lot, unless they don't have a memory voltage. Like I, that's my main concern. Like obviously I can fix any memory voltage limit. Like it's not a problem for me. It's just kind of like yeah, if you were buying this board and you wanted to do silly memory overclocks, that might be a problem if you don't know how to use a soldering iron or read data sh and read documentation for various voltage controllers. And sometimes you have undocumented voltage controllers and then it's like hard mode for figuring out how to get the voltage to go up. Um, not impossible, just much harder. Anyway, um, but yeah, so I do find the two dimmers very interesting, especially the like the, the super cheap one. Um, then we've got four dim boards and the four dim boards are much less interesting in my opinion because um, well, for example, the DS3H, right? Only up to 4,400 megahertz support. Um, so lower memory speed support. It shouldn't actually, like, in a 2x8 configuration or a 2x16 configuration, I don't think it'll really affect you too much. The SATA ports still, strict, uh, still stick straight up out of the board, which is dumb. The PCIe slot is still shifted down. You still get the 1X above it. Um, and the 1X below it. But the thing is, like, with this chipset, I don't think you could have more than, like, a 4X PCIe slot anyway. Um, though, I like, that's actually kind of a shame. Like, that, I like, Gigabyte has one board where, yeah, they have one board where you actually get a 4X PCIe slot, which is that 16X, which, you know, you might want to, I don't know, attach a, an M.2 SSD to your chipset. You can do that through that slot. You can't do that through a 1X, as far as I'm aware. Um, so, yeah, I'm surprised this doesn't have a bunch of M.2 slots, though. Like, there's plenty of space for that. So this board I don't get, and we'll get back to that one soon. So the thing with this board, though, is what's, what's weird here is this has a 5 plus 3 phase VRM, but, oh, and actually that's going to be for pure digital. Wait a minute, it's pure digital? Wait, so they must be using the same controller, so that... Interesting. Anyway, it used to be that Gigabyte had a hybrid voltage controller for their, um, for their like, low-end motherboards. That hybrid controller had some very funky software behavior. Um, it, like, very funky. 
that's the best way to describe it. <laughs> like if you over, like if you messed around with voltage control, that controller would somehow glitch out, and your SVI two TFN readings would stop working. Which was just like, how on earth does it do that? I have no idea, but it did that. Really annoying to work with. Um, obviously, these boards don't overclock, so that's not a concern, but it's just kind of like, yeah, I'm, I'm glad they got rid of that controller, because that controller was not fun. Um, anyway, so the weird thing between these two boards is this has eight low-side MOSFETs, whereas this has five. And so the funny thing about that is, like, so if you look at the, the power loss in a VRM, most of the power loss tends to happen in the low side MOSFETs, right? Um, and then there's some power loss in your inductors due to like resistance of the inductors and some core losses. And then you also have power loss in the high side MOSFETs, but high side MOSFETs don't handle so much current. So, but you still have switching losses from just switching the MOSFETs on and off. Um, but the thing is, um, this has more low side MOSFETs than this does while having one less inductor because this is a 4 plus 3, whereas this is a 5 plus 3, so this has more inductors, so there's less inductor losses. This has less inductor losses than this does. But I honestly, like, I, I would not be surprised if the VRM thermals between these two designs were the same or potentially even in favor of this because this has more low-side MOSFETs and those tend to be more important than high-side MOSFETs. I say tend, not always are, but this is a, like, yeah, so that that's just one strange thing between these two boards, is just, like, do three low-side MOSFETs make up for the difference in an entire extra phase? Because this has three extra low-side MOSFETs, that's not, that's not insignificant, that's, like, almost a, that's, like, a 60% reduction in low-side resistance, that's a 60% reduction in, in heat output for the low side MOSFETs. It's pretty significant. So, yeah. Whereas this is up like, th this reduces like high side MOSFET power loss by 25% and inductor power loss by 25%. Uh, or wait. So 20, I'm, I might be doing the math wrong on that. I'm pretty sure I'm doing the math wrong on that. But like this, this slightly improves high side power losses and inductor power losses. Whereas this like massively improves low side power losses, which I'm pretty sure this is more, more useful. At the, at the same time, this has slightly lower density. So this might uh, like hard, hard to like, the, the, I, I think it would be an interesting test to see which one of these VRMs actually runs cooler because I get the feeling more low side MOSFETs is more better than more phases. Um, anyway, um, especially in a scenario like this where you're going from like eight low side MOSFETs down to five. Anyway, what else is there? Right, so four dims, worse memory overclocking. You get Q-Flash. Now it's internal instead of in the rear I.O., so kind of more annoying to use if you need to use it. You don't get any troubleshooting LEDs as far as I can tell. Um, the rear I.O. doesn't really get any better, right? So this board, like, yeah, I don't get it. Th this one, like, I'm not a fan of this board. I'm a fan of this because this is going to be super cheap. It's better at memory overclocking. Like, what, 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 what is there to complain about except maybe the lack of a VRM heatsink? Whereas here, it's just like, well, we still don't have a VRM heatsink, but the rear I/O isn't any better, and you get more dim slots so that your memory can go slower while, like, are you actually going to run 64 gigs of, of memory on your A520 motherboard? And that's not, you know, considering the fact that you can actually get 64 gig dims for A5, like for two dim slots. Right, like, I, I just think, like, a 4-DIM motherboard at this price point is just kind of like, just, just buy higher density memory sticks. Though I guess there's a lot of people who, who like to do the whole, I'm going to buy two sticks now, and then I'm going to buy two more sticks later, and then I'm going to have memory stability issues because my memory sticks are completely mismatched and hate each other. Um, that, like, unless you, like, buy very specific speed bins, but, yeah, like, I, I would still probably... Well, I don't know. Well, oh, and then also you're going to have worse memory overclocking because you're running four memory sticks on what I assume is a four-layer daisy chain topology. So, yeah, that's that's going to be great. Um, like, I'm, I'm not a fan of this. I'm, I'm just not a fan. 
anyway, next board we have the DS3H uh, AC. So everything wrong with that previous board, but now you get Wi-Fi. <laughs> and it's Wi-Fi 5, not Wi-Fi 6, which is... Uh, like, Wi-Fi 6 is AX, Wi-Fi 5 is AC, so it's it's the slower, older Wi-Fi, but... So, I think, like, for this price point, that's roughly what you'd expect, right? Anyway, um, now we get the ITX board. Now, this I also find very interesting, because for a lot of ITX builds, like, you're so thermally constrained that you're probably not going to be overclocking. And this has a proper VRM with a proper heatsink, or at least relatively proper VRM, like... We are on 55 amp actual power stages instead of uh, 4C06 and 4C010, uh, 4C06 and and 4C10N on semiconductor MOSFETs that kind of suck. Like now we're on actual 55 amp power stages. Now it is a 4 plus 2 phase, so it's like it's a good thing we can't overclock. But yeah, this is actually a solid VRM. So you could have like a I, like stock 3950X ITX build with this. Makes perfect sense in my opinion. And it's, uh, I think, like it could very well be an eight layer PCB just because it's ITX. Um, either way, regardless of the layer count, this thing is really good at memory overclocking because, well, it's not a four layer anymore, but it still has two DIMM slots. And I know it's not, like, it can't be a four layer, it's ITX, you can't fit a four layer. Like, I don't think I've ever seen a four layer ITX board on anything modern because the, the boards are just too, com like, there's too much stuff to connect. So you can't do it on a four layer PCB. But yeah, like the higher layer count and the fact that this has two DIMM slots and it's just like, oh, so the, the already good two DIMM memory overclocking has gotten ever so slightly better and you get a proper VRM. Uh, the rear IO is still nothing like, it still isn't incredible and you still only get Wi-Fi 5, but you also get your Q flash. Like, yeah, like if you're doing a, a stock clock ITX build, this is a really nice looking motherboard for that. Um... So yeah, I think this is cool. And now we get to the Aorus Elite, which uh, I don't think is very cool at all. Um, and why don't I think... Well, okay, so I think the main highlight with this board is like, oh, you finally get better audio. Like, this is the only board I think that has... Actually, wait, this might be on AC. I'm not sure. Oh, no, no. So this is the only A520 board from Gigabyte that actually has the... ALC 1200 codec, um, but you still get the Realtek LAN, you get the worst memory overclocking because it's a 4 DIM, it's only got four PCB layers. Uh, we've got a interest, like the VRM on this is actually quite deep, like it's not, be I don't think it's better than the ITX VRM, but it, well, the, the funny thing about ITX VRMs is they have to be really overbuilt because you don't have enough space for a proper heatsink or enough space to spread the VRM out to lower the thermal density. So, you know, but again, like if you're running a stock 3950X, that's just like this is more than enough for a stock 3950X. And so so would this be. So it's not really a concern here. So like actually th this this board would make a lot more sense if this was a B550 motherboard. That's basically my main issue with it is just like, OK, so we've now got an even better VRM, but it's just like this is not a platform that you overclock on. So I don't know why you would bother unless unless you get PBO working. Like, if there's PBO support on this, then the VRM might actually be useful, but otherwise, really doesn't matter. Um, you still don't get any troubleshooting LEDs. You do get this silly RGB logo. Like, man, this is the thing I hate about RGB so much. You know, I don't actually have a problem with having parts that, like, I, I like color. I like color a lot, right? But the thing that I hate about RGB so much is that by far the vast majority of RGB implementations are completely half-assed. As in, you make a product, you make it monochrome, and then you stick RGB LEDs somewhere. Not, without a care in the world for if it's actually visually pleasing or not, you just stick some RGB somewhere so that you can say you have RGB support on the box. And it's just like, why did you even bother? This doesn't do anything for the motherboard visually. Like, you've got orange freaking highlights on your heat sinks. Why does this not have a... Like, what the hell is wrong with you? Anyway, um... Yeah, uh, like, this board just doesn't make any sense to me. I Like, it looks like it's going to be way more expensive than, than it should be for what it is. And that's the main issue I have with it, basically. 
Um, unless we find out, like, unless there's PBO support, because if there is PBO support, then actually this could make a lot of sense. Um, but, yeah, and I guess if you want the, the 4X PCIe slot, but I think you should honestly maybe check out just different motherboard vendors for, for a motherboard like this. Like, th this just, uh, this board's just weird in my opinion. It's like, what, what, like, premium A520 motherboard? Like, what? Like, it makes sense, to, like, this is, this is a relatively probably... Like, th this is a premium by A520 standard, like, A520 chipset standards motherboard right here as well. But the thing is, like, this actually makes sense because it's, like, it's ITX and, you know, you need to build ITX boards relatively nice. Especially if it's, like, hey, we want this to be for stock 3950Xs. But, like, this right here is just, like, I would, like, why would you put a 3950X in this? Well, I guess, actually, okay, no, I do... Well, no, the thing is, like, it, like you could also put a 3950X in this instead, and you can get probably similarly priced B550 boards to this, at which point it's just, like, put a 3950X in one of those instead. Um, but, yeah, it really depends on the price with this, I guess. Like, if it's under $100, I guess it makes sense. If it's over $100, it doesn't make any sense at all. Um Whereas this kind of makes sense. Like, the, the, the thing is, this is the only board where... Like, this adds a VRM heatsink to this VR, like, the DS3H VRM. And other than that, it's actually just exactly the same as a DS3H. And again, we have the pointless RGB logo that doesn't actually aesthetically add anything to the motherboard, but it's just kind of there so that they can say they have RGB support. Actually, wait, is this one mono? Like, wait, this one doesn't seem to be RGB. This one seems to just be orange. I'm going to scroll. Wait. No, no, it is RGB because, of course, it's RGB. Why wouldn't it be RGB? <laughs> Don't you want an RGB LED on your motherboard? <laughs> Actually, that's probably two RGB LEDs. Um, this is super dumb. Like, the thing is, like, the RGB doesn't even add a lot of cost to the motherboard, but it's just, like, but it also does like, why is it even there? Anyway. Yeah, so... This board exists. I like. I guess if you want to run a stock 3950X, this kind of has a good reason to exist compared to, like, I, I'm not, like, if I do buy this, I guess I should test if a stock 3950X can even, like, remotely run on something like this because I'm kind of worried for the VRM in, in a, you know, maxed out 3950X load scenario. And by maxed out 3950X, I mean Cinebench or something like that because you can actually hit the full power limit in Cinebench for for a 3950X. So, yeah, you, you don't even need to do anything extreme. It, like, if anything, the 3950... Like, because the thing is, the 3950X just downclocks if you run something like Prime 95 until it stays within that same power limit that it runs at in, in Cinebench. So, yeah, you don't even need to hit a 3950X that hard to get it pulling all 144... Like, all 144 watts that it's allowed to. Um, so yeah, that, that's one thing I'm really, really like, like, cause if this can run a 3950X, then it's just like every other motherboard in Gigabyte's A520 lineup is just dumb. Just get the H1, <laughs> just, just get this best memory overclocking, similarly terrible rear IO to everything else in the lineup, except the elite. Like this did add two extra USB ports. That's, that's something, um, you know, equal audio to all the other boards, or at least yeah, I'm pretty sure it's the same audio to all the other boards. But, yeah. So, that that's the board I find definitely the most interesting. And then the ITX board. Um, which I'm not actually considering buying because this this is probably going to be significantly more expensive than this. And I I have enough uh, AM, AM4 ITX. Like, this is just not that interesting in my opinion. This is interesting because this is going to be really cheap. It's a two dimmer. It might be great. It should be great at over memory overclocking. And then the main question is like, but will the VRM overheat if you stick a 3950X in it and run Cinebench? Um, that's that's the main thing I'm wondering about because this is just like yeah, like for a bare like a really just stripped down like I just want memory speed and I want a stock CPU and I want my big GPU and that's where all my budget went and that's why I can't have a nice motherboard. This thing makes a lot of sense for that kind of scenario, in my opinion. So, yeah. Anyway, um, I've basically said everything I have to say at this point um, about Gigabyte's A520 lineup. I, I think this, this, 
and, and when I say interesting, I'm not saying I'm I'm not saying I'm re recommending this board, but I just think this one has the most potential from what I've seen so from so far as a like interesting A520 motherboard. Um and then this also has the most potential. The others are kind of just like I I don't get it. Like I honestly just don't get what the rest of them are supposed to achieve. Anyway, so yeah, that's it for this video. Thank you for watching. Like, share, subscribe, leave any comments, questions, suggestions down in the comment section below if you'd like to support what I do here with actually hardcore overclocking. I have a Patreon. I also have a Teespring store. There's uh, so Patreon, you can just support me directly. Teespring, you can buy shirts, stickers, posters, you know, the usual YouTuber merch and you know, that will hope like that helps me do things like, well, buy motherboards like this. Though I guess honestly, I could probably ask Gigabyte for a review sample of this. It's just kind of like, it feels really silly to buy, uh, request a review sample of a $60 board. Like, I'd prefer not to, review, like, rely on review samples so heavily. Um, so, I might just buy this one. Um, and, you know, that that's what the Patreon and Teespring um, help out with a lot. Anyway, so, yeah, that that's it for this video. Thank you for watching, and goodbye.